Cool. Some people, who's here from SCE or from some other advertisement? Two, two people, three people. All right, cool. Um, well, great. Thanks for coming. If you guys weren't here at our info meeting last week, we really emphasized the fact that we are a community and not a class. This means that we're all going to be interacting with each other and helping all of us grow together. And so I'm just going to uh, present some logistics really quick. Uh, so first is this availability form that we posted on our Slack group, sjcumoclub.slack.com. Uh, if you guys haven't filled this out, please fill this out so that we know when to host workshops. Because after our info meeting, a lot of people came up to us and said, hey, we can't really make Wednesdays at this time. Can we move it to Tuesdays or something? So uh, clearly a lot of people are here for Wednesdays as well. So I want to make sure you guys uh, fill this out so we can schedule future meetings. Um, just a quick uh, survey, I guess. If we move the meetings, or between Tuesday and Wednesday, which meeting time would you prefer? Say it's Tuesday at 4.30 versus Wednesday now. If you prefer Wednesday now, raise your hand. If you can make Tuesday at 4.30, raise your hand. OK. So it seems like Tuesdays might work for a wider audience in general. But we'll figure that out. So please fill out that form. This is also posted on our Slack. Uh, second is an updated timeline. So our info meeting, we had this timeline. It was workshop one, and then workshop two, and then a reading discussion. We've moved some stuff around. So it's going to be a reading discussion next week. And then the second workshop will come after that. And this is simply because we want to spend a lot of time to make the workshops really good for you guys. And we're also hoping that some of you will be able to help us contribute to the workshop. Um, so this will give us some more time to develop that really well. And also this reading discussion for next week really ties well into the tutorial today. So for the reading group discussion, there is a channel on Slack called hashtag reading group. So if you guys have papers that you want us to read as a club, uh, go ahead and hop into that channel and suggest papers there. We'll also be posting the papers that we're going to be reading every week in this channel. Cool. Um, yeah, so with that, it seems like we have a really tight knit group of people here. And because we're a community, not a class, I was thinking that we could uh, go around. Everyone could just briefly say their name what brought them here to Machine Learning Club, and what you hope to achieve. So we can start up here. Maria, would you oh like to go? <laughs> oh, hello, everyone. I'm Maria. Uh, I know a little bit of machine learning from some courses like Fast.ai, and I hope to have more profound knowledge, maybe more fundamentals. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, my name is Jerome. And uh, I came here to learn more about machine learning. In general, I know about AI, but not in depth about machine learning. So I look forward to learning a lot with you all. Great. Nice to I'm Casper. Cool. Uh, I'm from Denmark, international student. And I do robotics back home. So I guess this is a really good tool. Uh, my name is David. Uh, actually, I just came here from uh, Library of Iron College this year. This year. Uh, I, I really like to learn uh, machine learning. Uh, but, uh, actually, I learned uh, Python online and somebody else was on <laughs> machine learning. So I want to learn uh, with this project. Uh, maybe we can make some project. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Chang Li. I came here from India. And uh, well, I got some interest in machine learning while uh, doing my undergrad. And I'm really hoping to learn something more than that I already know. So nice meeting you all. Awesome. Uh, hi, all. I'm Rakesh. I'm from India. Um, <laughs> the one thing which fascinated me about learning machine learning is because I had five years of work experience in the detailed industry. Uh, we were trying to implement a lot of machine learning on the retail front. So I thought it would be good if I get equipped with all the knowledge. Welcome. Uh, I'm Joey. I'm from California. I'm just interested in machine learning. I don't know too much about it. So I was wondering if I should do it. Yeah, I'm David. I'm also from California. And uh, I'm taking the CS 185C uh, machine learning knowledge class. So uh, yeah, I'm just like coming here to learn more about. 
Uh, you guys can like talk to the whole group. You don't have to just talk to me. <laughs> it's very <laughs> Hi, I'm Max. I'm also an international student for this semester from Switzerland. And I'm also interested in machine learning. So it's good to know about this workshop a couple of minutes ago. Okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> the best time. I'm Eric. Uh, I'm looking to do some side projects. Um, hi, my name is Pete. i um, from Thailand, and yeah, um, this is my my first experience on machine learning, and I'll do security machine learning, and um, I actually want to gain more uh, knowledge about uh, machine learning, and <laughs> yeah, we can share the idea if they have some project, and I'm gonna start some project with machine learning too. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Cedric Fosito. Uh, I'm from Cameroon. I graduated last semester as an electrical engineer, engineer, and I'm doing my master now, and I'm trying to get a little bit into machine learning. Okay, my name is Mark, and I'm the first time here to learn about machine learning, and I'm a master's student in computer science. Uh, my name is Ethan. I'm a first year. I really don't know anything about it, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> so, go in the back. Yeah. Hi, I'm Arvid. I'm also an international student. So yeah, I'm completely new to machine learning, but it's still cool. So, like it's really interesting. So, yeah, I just want to know more about it. Hi, I'm Samesh. Uh, I'm an international student from India. So I took a few classes taught by Professor Andrew Andrews, and that's what got me interested. Hi everyone, my name is Leah and I'm Leah as well. Um, and I'm just enjoying my time in Cambridge. Right, and I'm just enjoying my time in Cambridge. Uh, the Hi, I'm Nikolai. Uh, I'm also an international student from Switzerland. And um, I'm working on a senior project right now with J4. Do you have application? Do you have application? On the Hi, slide. Uh, this is Mashra Fosito. Yeah. I'm an international student from India. Uh, even I'm into this topic and yeah, I'm going to graduate. It should work. I'm a freshman here. I just um, want to get to know more about this certain topic and get gain some more experience. Hi, I'm Gaurav. Uh, I'm a third year computer engineering major. Um, I'm looking to get some information about how to use PyTorch and what good strategies about hyperparameters and all that. Awesome. Okay. I'm Gaston. I'm, a, I'm an officer of the club. I'm Going as an officer because I was really compelled by uh, our president Andrew's vision of trying to create a community and share resources so everybody can get better. Yeah, any other officers want to introduce? We technically introduce ourselves at the end of the meeting. Oh no! Hi, I'm Jason. I was absent at the info meeting because I was trying to procure more pizza, but it didn't really work out. Anyways, uh, yeah, I'm a master's uh, student here, computer science, uh, third semester. Um, I joined this club because Andrew, of course. Uh, but I also like the first machine learning, the real machine learning project I did was in my 256 class, and that was how to distinguish chihuahuas from muffins. And that was a really fun project, so I wanted to learn more to sort of refine my uh, 
process to maybe identify more uh, harder things than chihuahuas and muffins. <laughs> awesome, great. So it sounds like we have a really, really diverse background here and a lot of people who are interested in learning more about machine learning. I know it's so great that we have a diverse background because this means that the group projects that we do we can come up with really interesting ideas uh, that stems from many different backgrounds. So I hope that you guys uh, maybe heard something that interested you, that someone else is interested in as well, and you can work together in the future. Well, so now we will start uh, with our workshops. We have two workshops today. We have the beginner workshop, which is going to be 45 minutes, and then we have the advanced workshop following that. So uh, Eric and Jane will be re presenting the first beginner workshop. So we take it away, guys. Yeah. Also, you're free to stay for both workshops, or if you can't make the second one, you can leave, or you can come back later for the second one if you already got beginner stuff down. But yeah. And if you have questions at any time, feel free to just, just shout it out loud. Uh, yeah. Do we have access to the Jupyter Notebooks user community? Yes, they're going to be on GitHub. GitHub cool. so. Yeah, right. Do we, should we write the GitHub link on the Yeah, sure. sure. Good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Eric. I'll be presenting the first part. <laughs> this case, this is working. I'll be presenting the first part of the first workshop. So, if you have the machine learning libraries installed, you can follow along in code. If you don't, uh, you can just watch and maybe reproduce the code later. So first of all, uh, the first step, go to github.com slash sjsumlp. Click on the workshop iris project and either clone or download it. So download the zip folder. So workshop iris project? Yeah, iris project. Maybe you can show the iris project. Yeah. By the way, how much prior experience do you guys have with machine learning? Like, do you guys know some machine learning theory already, or you're totally new to it? Uh, if you're totally new, raise your hand. Well, okay, great. So maybe we can explain a little bit more about the theory before we do the workshop as well. Okay. So does everyone have the folder downloaded? Let me know if you need more time. Uh -huh. So if you're on a Mac, open your terminal. If you're on Windows, open your condo prompt. Now you can type uh, Jupyter Notebook. So are you recording your screen? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, okay. Cool. Andrew, so the recording is going to be kind of dark, but we're going to get some That would open Jupyter Notebook and then find the folder that you just downloaded. And as you can see here, we have the workshops. Um, I think you might have needed to unzip the folder. Oh, yeah. yeah. Unzip the folder, obviously, if you've downloaded it from the GitHub. Uh, it should be public, right? If you're on Windows, you need to unzip the folder first. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, just raise your hand if you have a question. I was trying to hold the pipe work. Okay. So, let What? So, go to your browser. So, you need to download the, the GitHub folder. Go to the browser and type in github.com slash No, there is GitHub. No, there is GitHub. We're able to open it in Jupyter Notebook. So we have two versions of the workshop. One is with output, that's with all the code filled out already. And the other one is the empty one. So if you want to code along, click on data workshop. Uh, if you just want to watch, click on data workshop with output. So for anyone who didn't hear, um, two versions. With output has all the code filled out already. You just have to watch. Uh, and the second one, just workshop, lets you uh, type in the code. Into this clone download and zip. So if you can try to open the one without output so that you can try to go, go along, right? Like it's not very interesting to see. So can you find the folder uh, that you missed? Uh, it's, it's, it's probably under down uh, machine learning cloud. Yeah. And then okay, scroll down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> library in Python that we use to uh, import, collect, and analyze data. So the data frame class functions similar to a 2D array, but it also has the column name and indexes. Also, this their series uh, data structure is similar to a 1D array, but also has the index and also uh, a label. So our first step if we're creating a program is to import it. So in this box, you can type import this as PD. And then click Shift Enter to run the code. And if it works, uh, there should be no error underneath. Next, we'll load in a CSV file. Um, I'll show you the CSV file here. This one has the column names at the top, and then the values for each of the columns separated by commas. So using pandas, we can import this easily. In this text box, type iris equals 
pd.feed underscore csv. Sorry. And then in parentheses, we're going to type iris2.csv. Okay, just open the data workshop. Okay, and it should run. Yeah, there you go. Just follow this code by ourselves. Next, you can look up some info about the data frame you just loaded in. Uh, we can type iris.info. You can do shift and enter. And iris. The data. Okay, so that's basically the table with all the data inside. Yes, question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So we'll look up more about this data frame in a minute. So you can type these two. Iris.info is the first output. And Iris.head gives you the first five entries. So you can visualize how the table looks like. So the context of Eric's workshop is that machine learning is all about learning from your data. So it's very important that you understand how to load in data and view it and visualize it so you can train a good machine learning algorithm. Okay. So that top part is the info and the bottom is the graph. Yeah, bottom is the, is the head. Yeah, it's the head, which is the first five entries. So from this information, what can you tell me about the data? Can someone tell me how many entries and columns does this have? Seven entries. It has 150 entries in seven categories. Yeah, that's correct. So we With see. two null arguments. Yeah. So now that we loaded it in, we need to pre-process this before we can fit it into our model. What's the input? So first, we need to take care of the missing values. Um, first, type iris dot is and a. Show what that output is. So that'll output false for values that are actually there and true for the missing value. If we append sum to it, it'll sum it all up so we can see that there are two missing values. Is not is a function? Is not, is it a function? Yeah, is NA. Is NA. That's the... What does this stand for? Uh, it, it checks if there are any... or. It oh, returns true if it's a null value. Okay. And false if it's a uh, actual value. And then the dot sum afterwards sums it all up. So you can count how many missing values you have. Any questions so far? Since we have 150 entries and only two of them have missing values, we can safely just delete the entries with missing values. So to delete them, type iris equals iris dot drop na. And then we can check the missing values with the function we just ran before. So how did the so this drops any row with a missing value. Uh, as you can see now, there are zero missing values in our data We can drop entire columns too. No, yeah, just try Let's say we didn't. We don't want this flower column. It's not useful for our model. So we can say iris equals iris dot drop 
column equals flowers. Yes, okay. I used that one. Check out the first slide. Thank you. Yeah. 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 As you can see now, uh, the flower column is no longer there. No, that's uh, me dropping. Yeah, I think it's another one. It's kind of hard to see in the back. I should have pulled it. Thank you. Can you see in the back? Yeah. <laughs> Can you go up a little bit up there? The drop. Can you go up to my uh, adding the delete column rows? Uh, thing. Can you yeah. scroll up all the way to adding the delete? Since the number is missing out, these are small. Yeah. So right here. Okay. Here's how you do it. In all the numbers. Virus. Virus.com. I'm not sure if you type the correct thing. You can take a look at the output version of the same notebook and you see all the answers there. So we can also draw all the rows that we don't need. Let's say we wanted to drop every row that had the species Pertosa. Here's how we would do that. First, we need to get all the indexes. So we'll type iris, iris dot species equals equals Pertosa. Those Satosa entries are the first 50 um, entries. Do you know how to use um, a shortcut way to insert the cell? Really? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So if you wanted to drop it, um, uh, you can just do iris equals iris uh, dot drop okay. time. Tab and do. So that'll drop the first 50 oh, rows. Tab. I think I got stuck somewhere. This one used to work, but I think that I missed something. Yeah. Uh, That's fine. Iris number is fine. Yeah, so basically, every cell you run, it, it'll. Uh, it's like sequential, right? So then if you run a cell to one of them, it'll actually do something. It'll do that same thing twice. So if that fails, then just go and do this. So it will restart. The, uh, yeah, it's fine though because you can just down. Oops. Yeah, you can just uh, rerun them and then it will be fine. Yeah. 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 Ye
question. Uh, you, you, you can actually follow the same rule that you have. So right now you create a new one. Yeah, he had a notebook. <laughs> you downloaded the zip, right? Yeah. And then did you unzip it? So where, where is that? It's in machine learning cloud. Okay, so the Jupyter notebook. Uh, yeah, go to the Jupyter. Uh, um, go to the home screen. Uh, click Jupyter. Oh, or you can save it first. Let's just save it. Sorry. Um, let's, let's Jupyter. And then go to the machine learning folder. It's on your desktop. Cool. Machine learning. And then open up data workshop. So now we just select the X and Y variables. The X variable is going to be the features of the flower. So this is going to be the length and width and the color of the flower. The Y variable is going to be the classification, the thing that we're trying to trying to train the model to guess. So for x, we need the first five columns. And for y, we need the last column. Yeah, so in pandas, there are two ways to do that. One is using the iLock function, which uses indexes. The second one is to use the lock function, uses the actual column names. Um, I'll show you one way to do it with iLock. You can type x equals iris dot iLock. <laughs> and inside the brackets, we're going to put a colon to signify that we're doing all the rows. And I guess the simplest way to do this is you can just list them all out. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, a more succinct way. You could also do this. These are equivalents. This is using slice notation. Uh, it's just 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 in Python. And after we set that, we can check the head of x, make sure it has the right column. Next, we can select the sixth column for x. Y. So we'll do y equals iris dot i lock. We'll have a colon to signify all the rows and just put a five here. And then we can check y, make sure we have the right column. And this is the species column. So we did that correctly. <laughs> Lastly, the color is a categorical, is, sorry, it's categorical de data. So we need to convert that into numerical data. And this has a function for this called pd.getdummies. So I'll show you what that does. We'll type x equals pd.getdummies. X. Then now we can check the head of x. So what get dummies does is it creates new columns for each of the values under colors. 
say the first entry had a medium color, under the medium column, there's a one under it. And under every other column, there's a zero. So the one represents that it has a medium color. This is also called one-hot encoding. So whenever you have string data, to, you need to convert that into numerical data before you can fit it into your model. So it, it splits this color column into these dummy categories. So now you have one category for each of the values. And, and it's for all string type data. Yeah. So if there were multiple string type columns, it would do that for each column. So you can see these entries have a dark color. So there's one under a dark column. And that concludes the first part of the first workshop. And how many do you have? Uh, I know some of you haven't installed the libraries that we will need to use in the next workshop. Is we're going to use this to validate that our model actually works. Does that make sense? I'll, I'll give you another example. So, so do you remember the first time you learned how to solve a, a quadratic equation? Right? Uh, you follow the steps on the test book, you follow like step by step, and you got the result. But how can you make sure that you really understand how to do this type of problem? You should be given a new problem that you have never seen, right? You're going to use the same technique and try to get the same result. So the same idea here. Uh, the training data set is, is for the, the machine to learn the model, and the test part is just to test, OK, the model actually works. Now, you might have another question. Do you? Do you have questions? Okay. So, so since, since we're going to split our data set into training and testing, so how do we split them? Like how much go to training and how much go to testing? Any ideas? Seventy thirty. Seventy thirty. Seventy thirty. Seventy thirty. Seventy thirty. Seventy thirty. Like why? Why seventy thirty? Because we want the model to learn more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we want the model to learn more. Yeah? Okay. Is the same? Yeah. Actually, this is the truth. Yeah, we wanted to practice more. You have, you know, do a lot of quadratic equations, and then eventually you can, you'll, you'll be able to solve it. The same idea here. So we, most of, in most of the cases, we, we split the most part into training, and then leave a small part into testing. Now another question. So since, so the main idea is the more data you have for training, the more accurate your, your model would be. Then since we oh, we have 150 data set, why don't we just leave 149 for training and leave only one for testing? It's not good that they, that they learn too much. Learn too much? Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit too hard to verify unless you because you only have one. Exactly. Exactly. So let's let's say you're taking <coughs> taking an exam for solving quadratic equations, and then you were only given one question. But that day is just your unlucky day. It's so hard, you cannot solve it. Can you can, can that say that you didn't learn anything? Yeah, you learned too much. So you learned too much, exactly. <laughs> maybe, enough, maybe you just exhausted it, right? So the same idea here. We want our validation test to be representative enough, to, to be able to cover different kinds of data. Yeah. So normally, okay, sorry. So, so, in, so in general, 70 to 30 is a good choice, or 80 to 20, or 90 to 10. It's up to you. It's up to the database. Let's say if I have a million, like a million, uh, one million data set, and it, uh, actually I can t I can take 99 percent for training, only one percent for validation. Why? What? Exactly. So if I have one million, one percent is uh, <laughs> ten thousand. Uh, yeah, ten thousand. So it's still a lot, right? So it's, 
It's fine. So it's really based on the data. So based on the data set. The idea is you want your testing to be representative. Okay. Oh, I talk too much. Okay. Yeah. So now maybe now you can understand why train test split. And here I have the test size, 0.2. That means I, I put 20% for testing. Okay. And the random state. Okay. In computer science, when we do when we select the randomly numbers, it's always pseudo random. So this is kind of like the C. We put zero here so that our answers are consistent. And you are free. Feel free to work with other, to use other numbers. It's it's fine. Okay. After splitting, let's see, let's let's see what's the shape of our train data set. Oops. Oh, I haven't run this. Okay. Make uh, make sure you run this part so that I can get the result. Oh. So 20, uh, 120 and 4, we're good. And then let's test uh, one more for Y. Okay, so like 80% uh, out of 100. Okay, that's it. We already split our model. Now, oh, sorry, data. Now it's time for do the to do the training part. Okay, we're going to use logistic regression as zero. Let's do the coding first. Sorry, can we yeah. go back to uh, the splitting? I yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Time. Oh, yeah. Thank you for reminding me. I actually forgot to explain this part. Yeah. So this is a, a function, right? So this function, it returns four variables, four results. And in Python, this is called mpack. <coughs> So all the variables will go to the, 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 the position that you put over here. So if you reorder those uh, variables, the result will be different. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure this is kind of the fixed part for Python uh, syntax. So that's how it works here. Is that your question? Are there more uh, others? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's just Python. Just yeah, it's just <laughs> Python. <laughs> so like if we redefine for both x and y the same um, Set, same uh, splitting, time, exactly. Same splitting, yes, yeah. yes. So that's why lazy people like Python. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now we are go. We, we can uh, import the logistic regression from the sector learn. Let's do from scalar model. Selection. Import. Sorry, this is the wrong. Oh, sorry, 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 guys. Not um, wrong cheat sheet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what happens, right? Uh, model import logistic regression. This is our base model. And then let's import another thing metric uh, from. I will explain this later. And then let's do log rag logistic. Make sure I don't have any typo. Regression. part. Okay, let me explain this. Hmm. That's the part that I, I spent a whole weekend to, <laughs> to work. So we're going to, so what we're doing here is we're using this logistic regression model to 
uh, find a relationship between the x values, you remember the, all the numbers? Find the relation between those numbers with the labels. So this logistic, logistic regression is actually a classifier. It helps to classify your x input into different y labels. That's what, what it does here. So we need to, for, to, in order to use that, we need to import it first. And also, this matrix, this matrix is also a handy tool for us to predict how good our model is. It, it will give us a score. It will show the, the result. And see, if you, after you import this logistic version, this is a class. So you give some variable to this class, it return you this object. And then you, you just call this object, so class has some functions, right? This object called fit, your x and train, uh, x train and y train. This basically gives you the model. And after this, you just call logrep.predict, and this is the x test part. So the, the input they want to test with your, your re result. And the y pred is the prediction that you get. So do you have any questions on logistic regression? Or any, any questions so far? Let me take a very, let me try to explain how logistic regression works. By the way, I'm a math major, so. Uh, I will try not to use it. Kind of price. Oh, yes, it's a price. We're for the price. So, normally this is a very common problem to do a linear regression, right? If you, if you just straight a linear here and say, okay, Somewhere I can, I can put the line here, and if I say the, the house is kind of in the middle, let me get my prices some, somewhere like this. Okay? So this is like a linear regression. Now, what if, now, to our pro problem, now the x is not the housing price, but, but the, the, the measurement of flowers. Let's say the simple, this is the paddle left. This is the small lens and this is the longer lens. And we also have our data. But how can we put a y value here? What is our y value now? Species. Species. But how can you put species? How, which species go up, which species go down? There's no way, right? They are labels. So what do we do with, with those? We cannot use linear regression now. It, so this, because the only reason is because of y value are labels, they're not numerical anymore. Therefore, there is a very popular function that I'm not gonna tell you. Um, but what it does is just change, you know, this function will convert the linear into this S shape, but the Y value is from zero to one. This gives us the probability of that, that input being a certain type of flower. Does that make sense? So, so to ignore all the math behind, you just need to, the main takeaway is somehow logistic, logistic regression takes all the x input and map it to this s-shape curve and it gives out the probability. So if, let, so, so let's say for a sunflower, it belongs to Satosa. Our target is to find this kind of curve. When you put your values, x values in, in, into here, it will tell you. Oh, well, it tells you it's a really high, proba a high probability that it belongs to Satosa. This is how logistic works. So it, it maps probability. Any questions? Yes. How do you do multi Great question. So yeah. So we have since since we have three classes, only one graph is not enough. So actually, there are three three graphs, three S shapes. Gonna put it input. Try this. It's low. Try this. Low. But try this. It's high. Okay. This time. Make sense? The question is. Okay. So we have. Uh, we have three type of classes, right? In our data set. If you put an input right here, well, what is this? This Y is belongs to Satosa or versi color or what type of this flower is? Okay, so like one Y is for one species? Yeah, so why don't we label the grass? This is the whatever. Well, B versicolor, I think. 
Yeah, some type of Versicolor. Uh, ver Let's see. Color. Flower what? B, flower B, or ABC, flower ABC. Yeah. So this is all, well, actually you cannot print it out by oh. using logistic regression. Th this is the concept idea, you know. You know, mm -hmm. you know this is not actually, uh, you can mm -hmm. take it out, but th the idea is that you're gonna, for, for how many classes you have, you're gonna have how many S shape you have. Mm -hmm. And once you, you once you take your input in, it will give you some probability. Classes in this case, you mean species? Yes, species. sorry, species. Okay. The labels, how many kinds of species you have. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. That's good. So that's how logistic regression works. Yeah, we're math majors now. Woo! Uh, okay. <laughs> so let's run the result. Right. Yes. Um, what is where you say like solver equals loop linear? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like solver, specify? okay. So, <laughs> oh, they're already a hard question. So, what solver do, it does is, okay, how can you find this S shape? Originally, well, at the first, first start, all the parameters, they are randomly given, for example, by some random numbers, right? Like random shapes. But we wanted to tweak this shape to be this S shape that we're looking for. So how to find this S shape? you need to use the solver. The solver is kind of like optimizing solver that helps you to, okay, go left a little bit, go right a little bit, go up, go down. So it helps you to tweak it to the S shape that you're, you're looking for. There are different kinds of solvers. Uh, Lovelina is one, and the SAG is one, SAG, and SAGA. There are tons of solvers. But the main, main idea, or all, all you need to remember is this solver just helps you to get your result, to, to get to the target that you're looking for. Basically, it's the tool, the transportation. How can you get to, to LA from here? You can take a car, you can take a plane. Basically, that's what solver is, okay? And multi-class is also, okay. You, I know you're gonna ask this. <laughs> ah, okay, this is a multi-class. If you were using live linear, Multi-class auto means it's going to use one versus rest, which so is multiple classes. Basically, that's what, what t it says here. Ignore this. Yeah. You're going to use this. OK, so the result is 96. This is, which is 97, almost 97% accurate. Good or bad? Good or bad, guys? 97%? That's good, that's good. That's pretty really nice, right? <laughs> yeah, let's see. That's what looking for. I'd say that's that's like an A, right? That's good enough. <laughs> let's let's print out actually let's print out Y prime. Let's see what is there. So this is the actual prediction for each input. X uh, oh. test. See, if you just print out y pred, you, you are going to figure out by yourself how, how, how many are uh, correctly classified, how many are not. But, you, but using this metric accuracy score, you will get a number. So this is easier for you to see the result. Any questions so far? Yeah. Yes. Actually, uh, like we have different species, so we do different graphs according to the petal length, right? Um, like different, gra different graphs according to the petal length. Right. Different graph? Uh, like the probability graph? for uh, like the probability graphs for, for different classes. Yeah. So for, for different species, it's like different curves for each and every species, right? Yes. Yeah. yes. So for like a particular petal length, it will check the probability in which uh, species it would lie according to the high probability. So it checks each and every graph and uh, gives the answer which is having the highest probability, yeah. or there's a particular number for it that we just take it and yeah. Uh, like maybe 90%, if we get 90%, so we don't check forward and do we just like something like yeah, that? Yeah, this is how I understand about this. I, I feel it's an easier way for me to remember, mm -hmm. but it's not verified, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's how I understood this. Uh, yes, that's how, uh, yeah. Why didn't you convert the categories into a numeric variable? Sorry, can you say that again? Why didn't you convert it into a numeric variable? Why don't I? Yeah. Why are you using the categories as a variable? You mean why, why don't I convert uh, them into one holding, one holding county. Okay, yeah. This is because this is our Y labels, the one that we wanted to predict. If we are going to predict something that if, if there are some variable in our X has string, has object, how can you do the linear fitting or the logistic regression fitting? 
uh, fitting because you all all you so for the for the x you all need um, I, it's not, I cannot talk now. <laughs> so for x you only can use numerical values. If we have something that's in our x data set, you cannot use object you cannot use string. In that case is you need to do one hard encoding. Does that answer your question? Yes. How do you interpret those results? Because I just see them. Oh, okay, okay. So this is the, like the first X test. It predicts as to be Virginica. Mm -hmm. And the second X test is that the model tells me this is Versi color. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So on so forth. And if you wanted to like verify yourself, if you look at the data, each of your data has the correct answer, and then you just compare the answers, right? So let's say like you know in one of the photographs or one of the data sets, it said it was versicolor, and the first one predicted versicolor, or, or it was virginica, and then the computer predicted virginica, that's a match, right? But if it predicted versicolor instead of virginica, that's a fail. So this, the, <coughs> this one, right? Yes, 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 exactly. But it's randomly, the 20% yeah, yeah, yeah. is randomly retrieved by the code, so oh, yeah. you might want to find your X and find the exact Y value. So this is the graph that I just drew, so you don't need this anymore. Now, let's do some confusion matrix. Okay, I'm gonna introduce another useful tool to understand your data. Um, this is called confusion matrix. Let's do, uh, where is it? Okay, from sklearn dot matrix import confusion matrix. Print confusion matrix y test y oops y quit and shift it, enter. You get this matrix. So what is this? I'm gonna draw column here. <laughs> result for our prediction. And in this way, in this dimension, this is actual values for, I don't remember, the first one is the Tosa, and the second one is the Versi color. The third one is, I don't remember. And the, this, in this dimension, is the predicted value. matrix. So if if it's actual if the actual value for those testing points is Satosa and the predicted value is also Satosa, they will meet in diagonal. For, for example for this one if the actual value for those testing points are versicolor and the predicted one are also versicolor, they will meet here. Same here. Okay? It means that if all the numbers are in diagonal, it means that your actual values match with your predicted values, which are good. But how about this one? So it, pre it predicted to be this one that I, I don't remember, and the actual value is versus color. So this is the one that got least predicted. That's how you read this matrix. Okay? That's confusion. Okay. Thirty is the. Do you remember we, we took twenty percent to be our ta uh, testing results? So there are a hundred fifty times point two is thirty. That's the testing results. And let's plot. Okay, so let's better understand. That's one last thing. We're gonna need to bring some plot so that we can see why versicolor color can be mispredicted to be uh, the type. So. Do import. Oops. Not blood blood high blood as PLT. And Satosa with this variable iris. Iris. Let's call those 
species. Species. When it equals to Sotosa. So what it does is, let's take out the species of iris, which are equal to Sotosa, and take all but take all those columns into the Sotosa variable. Okay. And we do the same thing. Oh, the third one is called Virginica. Virus. Oh, I should do copy paste. Um, <coughs> equals to where's where's the color? Okay. Copy paste for the third one. So change it to be. And shift run. Shift enter. Okay. You just retrieve all the all the values into three variables, and now let's do plot. So you can just do plot because we import the matplotlib job high plot as plt. We just call plt. Let's do a scatter plot. Setosa values. All the column is zero. Um, and Satosa the values. All the rows and first column, let's give it color. C equals to red. Change this to be versicolor. And change the color to be maybe blue and green. For example, so well, let's do the head. It gives this table, and what we're doing is we're retrieving the so see all the rows, but zero column, the simple length of Satosa, and all the rows, first column, and the simple width of Satosa. So basically, we're retrieving we're retrieving this for if three kind of species, and we do a Virginica spelled with an I. Okay, another v -I -R. type of? V I R. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, don't have typo. And we do the same thing, and then we just run PLT show. Oops. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. So here, you need to change, change this to be Virginica, right? So run all of those again. That's the plot we have. See? So there's no way we can plot all the four dimensions in one plot, so I only picked the first two columns. And see so the versicolor and the virginia are kind of mixed here. Maybe, maybe that can explain why we got one missed predicted over there. Okay? Let me see the code, please. Yeah, yeah, sure. Where's the job? <laughs> That's on you. <laughs> mm -hmm.